Singapore, home to 5 million people. Every day, around 4,000 public buses ply our streets, ferrying us to work, school and play. We commute between 84 mass rapid transit stations spread across four lines covering over 130 kilometers. Total number of taxis on our roads? Some 25,000. For all the trips we make on our buses, trains and taxis, do you ever wonder why there are only two public bus and rail operators serving so many people? In contrast, we have seven taxi companies competing for a piece of the taxi pie. To answer this question and understand how market structures and competition affect our public transport policies, let's start with the basics. The market structure continuum. Monopoly, oligopoly, monopolistic competition and perfect competition. At one end, we have Monopoly, a single firm, selling a product or service with no close substitutes, absolute barrier to market entry. Next, Oligopoly, a few firms selling homogenous or differentiated products with high barriers to entry. Then we have monopolistic competition, many firms selling differentiated products with low barriers to entry. And finally, perfect competition. Many competitors selling homogenous products with freedom of market entry and exit. A large part of how we shape public transport policy depends on the nature of service and needs of commuters. Let us illustrate by first looking at public buses. Prior to independence in 1965, there were more than 10 private operators running bus services around Singapore. On the market structure continuum, bus services would be close to monopolistic competition, characterized by many small firms selling differentiated products. You might think having lots of operators equated to better service. Not necessarily. In reality, competition in the market often resulted in operators neglecting less popular routes. They concentrated on high demand routes. Unbridled competition also led to wasteful duplication of services and inefficient operations due to lack of economies of scale. Poor service was the norm as operators cut corners to reduce costs to survive. Fortunately, this is no longer the case. Today, our bus service has become more of a duopoly. SBS Transit and SMRT Corporation operate our entire public bus network island-wide. The big benefit of having only two operators is that they will be able to reap economies of scale in bus operations and keep their costs lower than if there were many operators. Operators can benefit from economies of scale, such as during purchase of buses, bulk buying of diesel, and cheaper parts and maintenance costs for their fleet. But is there also a downside to having only two operators? What's to stop them from charging high prices and offering poor service at our expense since they have so much market power? This is where regulation comes in. In Singapore, we have set up the Public Transport Council or PTC as an independent body to regulate transport fares for both buses and trains. PTC imposes a set of quality of service standards to ensure that service standards are not compromised. With two operators concentrating in different geographical regions, PTC is also able to impose what we call the Universal Service Obligation or USO in short on our bus operators. What the USO does is to ensure both operators maintain a comprehensive network of services including unprofitable routes. In other words, no more ignoring Jalan Ulu and only concentrating on popular Orchard Road. One disadvantage of today's bus industry structure is that it only provides yardstick competition which benchmarks the two operators against each other. Going forward, the Land Transport Authority plans to introduce what we call competition for the market. So instead of having bus operators cannibalize each other by competing in the market for individual routes, we have them compete for rights to operate in entire markets. 
in this case, a package of routes for a fixed period of time. This eliminates wasteful duplication and promotes better integration of services as LTA sets the rules for competition. Competition for the market introduces the element of contestability into the equation. In a contestable market, the number of firms is not important. What is important is that the threat of competition should be sufficient to keep prices low and prevent abuse of monopoly power. As operators stand to lose large stakes if they fall behind the competition, this will drive efficiency, resulting in better services and affordable fares. Our mass rapid transit system evolved quite differently from our bus services. Rapid transit systems tend to exhibit characteristics of a natural monopoly because of the high cost of building and maintaining the necessary infrastructure. Natural monopolies occur in industries where there are enormous economies of scale present such that a single firm can effectively and efficiently supply the market at lower cost than two or more firms. To counter this, the government funds the capital cost of the rail infrastructure while the operators bear the operating and maintenance costs of running the system. This removes one of the main barriers to entry. When first introduced in 1987, the MRT was initially operated by only SMRT trains as the network could only support one operator of sufficient scale. But this changed with the introduction of the North East Line, operated by SBS Transit in 2003. The shift to a duopoly allows for the benchmarking of standards between the two operators while allowing operators to continue reaping economies of scale. This provided a basis from which to drive towards even greater efficiency and better service. As with our bus services, LTA has plans to encourage further contestability in the rail industry. This will be done through shortening of future rail licenses and having competitive tenders for new rail licenses. Incumbent operators are kept on their toes to consistently innovate and provide better service to commuters due to the greater threat of being replaced by other players, including new ones. The taxi service in Singapore operates much closer to an oligopoly with a few firms dominating the market. There are seven taxi cab companies today. Taxi supply and fares are liberalized. Service standards are regulated to protect commuters' interests. There are several reasons for this difference between the taxi cab services and the bus and MRT services. First, with less economies of scale and lower barriers to entry, Taxi companies have less market power. It is easy for new taxi companies to enter the market. The taxi market is also relatively small compared to buses and trains with fewer trips made daily. In addition, it serves more as a complementary service rather than one of the main modes of public transport. So less regulation is needed and taxi services can be left to run more independently based on market forces. 
As a result of these differences, there is greater competition in the taxi market. Taxi companies need to be more innovative and responsive in meeting consumer needs. This comes in the form of greater flexibility in pricing and supply to meet demand at different times of the day or days of the week. It also encourages taxi companies to provide more differentiated services in niche areas like limousine cabs or medical chaperones. So we end up with better service in general for all commuters. Now that we have a better understanding of where each of the services fits on the continuum and how that in turn shapes policies and regulations, let's ponder the following questions.